Do we think that conventional loan limits will increase? I keep hearing talk about that, but so far nothing. But I think it's important for anyone new on, on the call today to, to know that you, you can get up to 10 investor loans. Uh, you know, you can get 10 loans for rental houses through conventional means, through Fannie and Freddie that are locked into today's really, really low rates. You can get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage on a rental home and get 10 of those. And if you're married and you both work and you both show income, you might each be able to get 10. So 20 fixed rate loans at low interest rates, it's incredible. Um, now, can you go beyond that if you've already maxed out your 10? Right now, it's going to be more portfolio loans. And I was just at the IMN conference uh, in December in Phoenix, and you just cannot even imagine the number of lenders that were there. Booth after booth after booth was lenders. They've got so much money they want to lend, and they really like lending on portfolios, uh, people who own a bunch of properties. So if you have those 10 conventional loans, you might want to talk to one of the portfolio lenders and uh, you can talk to your investment counselor at Real Wealth Network to get some of those names or just go on the resources page at, on our website and see if they would refinance all the properties you have into one loan and then you would free up those conventional loans to, to get 10 more. That's that's one way to go about it. All right. God forbid, okay. God forbid, but if someone like Warren or Sanders were to become president, how might this affect interest rates, et cetera? Uh, you know, the way that our government works, or has at least in the past, is there have been some controls on the president, and that is, of course, Congress. So generally, when we have a really strong president who's you know, like really Republican or really Democrat, then you generally have uh, a bunch of people, you know, senators that are voted in to balance it out. And that's what we saw here with uh, with the Trump administration, where it was the first couple of years, it was pretty much, you know, a free for all because it was mostly Republicans and, and they were voting. There was a majority. And then at the midterm elections, then uh, that changed and and it's harder to get things through. So I imagine if we had a very leftist president that got voted in, there would be some limits on the things that they could do based on the gridlock that you would see in Congress. Um, at the same time, what we've seen more of is executive orders. So as many executive orders as Obama made and now Trump and potentially the, you know, setting the stage for the next president, that is what is more concerning that seems more and more decisions are being made without Congress. So that would be scary. I, I don't know that the really, really big decisions can be made unilaterally like that. So my my guess would be that there would be gridlock. Yeah, otherwise we find ourselves in a situation where there's a lot of young people today. They're the largest generation today. They have a lot of power um, through their voting power uh, and they're angry. You know, now if you're a Gen Zer or a millennial, you might uh, insult somebody by, by calling them a boomer because <laughs> they think baby boomers are the ones who have created all the problems that they're going to have to face as they grow up. So uh, there, there is a backlash and that would probably show up in the next election. So the bottom line is we don't know what's going to happen, but at the end of the day, people still need to live somewhere. And if you are a good landlord, if you provide a good quality property and you're fair, you know, and you're offering a property for the median or what, what the average person can afford, uh, whether it doesn't really matter what their politics are, you know, they're going to need a place to live. All right. Any thoughts on rent affordability rising and room to increase rent? Hmm. It depends on the market for sure. You know, it depends on the area. In certain areas where rents are still really affordable, there, there certainly is room for rents to go up. Uh, whereas I know that in the Silicon Valley, we've kind of seen it stabilize. And in New York, I believe it's stabilized. I, I believe parts of Dallas have stabilized because there's been so much more inventory coming online. But don't quote me on that. You'd have to go to a really great website like Rent Range or um, you know, any, anywhere where you find the local rents to see <clears throat> and verify. But the most important thing is to make sure that you are understanding the local rents of the area and not trusting someone who doesn't really know. 
a lot of times people will go find a, a real estate agent in an area and buy a house and that real estate agent will say, yeah, I think it'll rent for this, but they don't really know because they're not a property manager. So never take uh, the person who's selling you the property, never take just their word for it because they're selling you a property. Just like any anytime someone's selling you something, there's an ulterior motive. So just always just double check. You can, you can verify online in so many different ways to see what the local rents are. Um, if you were projecting to get $1,300 rent and, and everything else around there is $1,000, you're probably not going to get it. But if you if you look at the comps and everything's going up 100 bucks, then you're good. So just be really, really conscious about um, local rents. And remember, a broker may not be an expert on that topic. They are an expert on selling property. I, I had a busload of people we were taking to uh, taking around Cleveland to show properties there. And um, somebody on the bus was from Australia and said that they were in escrow on an apartment in Cleveland and could we drive by it? And I said, sure, what, you know, wh why are you buying it? And he said, oh, it's by a great school and it's fully occupied and blah, blah, blah. Well, we drove by it and uh, it was definitely not near a school. I mean, it was near a school, but it was on the other side of the tracks, not a nice area. There was for rent signs everywhere on that street. Um, there were a lot of people sitting around that looked like they weren't working on a on a work day. And uh, when we got out of our van, uh, we people were throwing rocks at us, telling us to get out of the town. But we took a picture of the for rent sign in front and just as a joke, called the property manager of that apartment to see if it truly was 90% occupied and we said, well, there's 40 of us here on a bus and we all want to live here. Do you have occupancy for all of us? And the property manager said, yes. So <laughs> again, you got to do your own due diligence always on rents because the person selling it to you may not know. Um, China could dump U.S. bonds as a trade weapon. Yes, that's possible. But from what I've heard, it's very unlikely because it would hurt them as well. So I, I doubt that's going to happen, but the question is how much longer will people be interested in buying U.S. debt, given that uh, you know our debt to GDP is so high? It certainly ha doesn't seem to be slowing down too much, and a lot of other countries are in worse shape. So the way I've been told from economists I've interviewed on The Real Wealth Show is that we're kind of the best deal in town, even though it's not not the best historically, but that if you're getting negative rates overseas and you come to the US and you get something, it's better than negative. So very, it's not my area of expertise, but I think it's unlikely. What do you think of buying lower end homes in Indiana that sell for 50 or 60,000 that rent out for $700 a month? I think you better make sure you get a lot of input on that. We have done that in Indiana and we've gotten really, really hurt from that. Um, there's a different tenant when you get under $900 a month. Um, even in Indiana, it's just, it's a different kind of tenant, tends to be lower income, tends to be more mobile and, um, doesn't have a lot of savings. So if something goes wrong, then they, they you know, if they get sick or go through a divorce or lose their job, they don't have the reserves necessarily to pay the rent. Um, also in Indiana, at that price range, you may be in really high crime areas, which is just a nightmare. Um, no matter how nice the house is, if it's a dangerous area, you're going to have trouble keeping that place rented. And when it's vacant, it gets vandalized um, in, in high crime areas. So the first thing I would do before buying any lower end home is check out the crime rate. The second thing I would do is talk to three to four property managers to get their opinion because a lot of property managers are afraid to go into those areas and afraid to, to try to collect rent from those areas. So just do your research. Don't trust the person selling you. Uh, the person selling you might be buying those for real cheap and maybe 20,000 and selling it to you for 50,000. I've seen that happen. Again, I'm not saying that's the case here, but just, just make sure you've talked to enough people. Another thing I do is I just, you know, make sure you go see it, go see it. And in the daytime might look a lot nicer than at nighttime.
when people are afraid to go outside. So what I'll sometimes do, I, I don't buy in those neighborhoods anymore, but when I did, I would go there in the day when it was safe and I would talk to the neighbors uh, because they're usually out sitting on their on their balconies, not working. So um, yeah, talk to them and just kind of find out what the neighborhood is like and if they like it there and if it's safe and what to be aware of. Okay, uh, next one, happy new year. Happy new year to you. Uh, what is your location pick in the Southwest? High cash on cash, safer place to start single family rental investing. Very good question. Um, Atlanta is a hot, hot market. There's so much growth happening there and will continue over the next decade for sure. Um, I, I live in the LA area now and I can tell you that lots and lots of films are being shot in, in the south part of Atlanta. Um, I know lots of people in the industry that are in the lighting or sound or and the actors themselves that are, are having to live in Atlanta part-time. So they're just buying houses um, near the studios and, and living there half the time. And so that's just the uh, film industry. You've got tech industry, you've got, um, you know, the, the one of the largest airports, um, just so much growth in Atlanta. So I, I'm not going to say it's the highest cash flow you'll get, but it's considering it's a high growth area, I would certainly consider Atlanta. Um, and you can get new homes there. Let's see, what else uh, in the Southwest? Um, parts of, of Texas, which isn't necessarily the Southwest, but there's parts of te Texas where it still cash flows. If you really want higher cash on cash, I would, and, and you're maybe thinking Florida, our Tampa team is still buying older homes and renovating them and they are they are bringing in prices that are pretty low with pretty high cash on cash returns for Florida in an area that is growing really really fast so I, I like that market um, I would say Birmingham is is a very good market for the high cash on cash and Huntsville the only problem is it's kind of hard to get properties in Huntsville because it's a hot market and, and there's not a lot of inventory there, but definitely a good market and, and the Birmingham team is uh, is great as well. Um, Southeast, yep, I think I, I think I knew you meant Southeast. Okay, would you buy and finance 25% down or pay cash? You're gonna get your best returns when you finance, so I would, I would always finance if you can, if you can lock in those 30 year fixed rate loans. Um, you get 10 of them, it just makes sense because when you're, then your cash on cash return really increases. Cause let's say you're buying a hundred thousand dollar home. You're only putting $25,000 down. You've got 25,000 in, um, but you might be cash flowing $300 a month. Uh, so when you do the, do the math, it's you're making more money when you finance. Plus as we see inflation uh, where it's, it's better to have debt in an inflationary environment because Inflation really, it makes the dollar less valuable and your debt is in dollars. So it makes your debt less onerous as well. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons why the government wants inflation is to make debt kind of go away a little bit. So we have the same opportunity to kind of free up that equity, get more homes by financing, increasing your cash on cash returns and kind of beating inflation. Uh, what areas can you find properties with rent to purchase price ratio over 0.8%? You can still get it in Ohio, in Michigan, you know, in the Detroit area, but and we've also seen appreciation in those areas, which is rare. So that's exciting. You get both the cash flow and the appreciation. Um, I think you can still get it in the Midwest and say Kansas City, St. Louis. We don't have teams in those areas, but basically it's going to be the Midwest. It's really hard to get over 0.8% in, uh, you know, in the in the southeast where there's the, you know, so much population growth and and job growth. But you you might be able to. Okay, someone said we gonna be flying out in LA. Hi there, I look forward to meeting you at our next event too. <laughs> Hi Mark, any chance of Detroit $1,000 properties to come back to normal price? I wouldn't touch it. Uh, I basically 
what is being said here is that there's still properties in Detroit that are just being given away. I assure you that if someone's giving away a property, there's a good reason for that. Um, probably high crime, probably just massive dilapidation. We like Detroit, but only certain neighborhoods, and you've got to be extremely cautious of all the other neighborhoods. So it's just certain neighborhoods that are growing, that are safe, that are near jobs. Those are the ones I would focus on. It's real tempting to buy a house for $1,000, but I assure you it's not $1,000. There's thousands that have to go into renovating it and then trying to get a tenant in there when it's a high crime area, real tough. So be careful of those. It's exciting, but not in reality. Do you primarily focus on single families or is there a multifamily strategy for 10, 20, or 50 units? Uh, some of the teams that we refer people to that uh, find properties and, and uh, help renovate them and manage them, they do sometimes have access to multifamily property. Now, the thing is, if you're new to investing, you've got to you've got to understand that multifamily is a totally different animal. If you're just starting out, start with single family, get your feet wet, learn it, then go on to the multi units. I know there's a a big fad right now to buy the multifamily. I was just at the single family rental conference with some major hedge funds that have left multifamily and are now only focused on single family because they're getting higher returns in the single family. So, and, and we're able to get financing on portfolios. You can get one loan on a bunch of properties, just like multifamily, you know, get these commercial loans. So just, we've had a lot of new investors ask about multifamily We've said, sure, we can send you to a broker and they can help you out. But what it really came down to is, is these people were not ready at all to invest in multifamily. A lot of the value, you know, the prices have gone up substantially because there's so many people looking for multifamily. So the numbers just don't necessarily work out as well. So if you're an experienced multifamily investor, by all means, talk to our teams, see if they can find you something. Um, if you're new, I highly recommend you start with single family it's a lot easier to understand. You can get your feet wet, learn, and then eventually sell those and move up to a multifamily if that's what you want. A lot of people are investing in other people's syndications in multifamily, um, but remember you're only getting a tiny piece of a large pie, which may be great. It may work out really well in your favor, but it may not be as great as just buying your own your own property. You know, So just compare the numbers and Talk to the different teams across the country. Uh, we've got a great event coming up in February where all 15 teams will be in Jacksonville. You can meet all of them. Let's see, that's February 8th in Jacksonville. Check it out on our website at Real Wealth Network. I think you'll be uh, excited to see that you'll be able to meet all the teams in one place and get an idea who does multifamily and who you trust and you know build, build your portfolio that way. Can the recording be shared? I need to drop off. Yep we will be uploading it on the website. What are your thoughts on the high property tax in Dallas? Uh, I don't like it. It's high. It cuts into cash flow, but it just is what it is. So if you get a property that has enough cash flow to kind of offset the high property taxes, then it may be worth it. Back 10 years ago, we did not care because the cash flow was so high. It just, I mean, think about it, $100,000, $120,000 home. Sure. 3% tax, it's still so much lower than uh, what you'd be paying on one house in California if the, if the house is $500,000 at 1%, but you're getting $120,000 home at 3%. It, it can work out if you have enough cash flow. If it doesn't, then you might be better off uh, getting into a suburb of Dallas where the hopefully the taxes are lower. I know there's been talk about property taxes going down in Dallas because prices have gone up so much that the locals are pretty upset about it. There's been initiatives to bring those taxes down, uh, just like in California. You know, when you're in a flat market and price and values never go up on properties and they don't really mind so much, but when properties have tripled in value in the ta last 10 years, uh, the locals are upset about that because their taxes are going up too. So that could reverse a little bit or they could lower the taxes. But in the meantime, if the property is in an area with strong job growth and population growth and and the rents cover the cost of those property taxes, which by the way, go to pay for the great schools there, then it still might be worth it. Uh, traditional lending for single family homes might be more stringent, but the private syndication has emerged as a lenient source of capital. 
could the complacency in this private syndication space be a big enough trigger for the next financial crisis? I don't think so. Uh, in the single family world, institutional owners of single family homes, they're, they're only about 3% of the market. There's about 8 million Americans who own one rental property and uh, the hedge funds own about, I don't know, three, 300,000 homes. So there's no comparison, at least in the single family space. Uh, they just don't own that many. It's the mom and pops who own the bulk of single family homes. So that's good. 